you have a Bible, please open back to Philippians chapter 1. We're going through the book of Philippians. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one in the chair in front of you, and it's on page 677 in your chair Bible, page 677. I'll read verses 1 uh, through 2, verses 1 through 2 again, and then I'll pray and we'll begin. Philippians 1, 1 through 2, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for this day. God, you're so good to us in so many ways, and God, one of those ways that you're most good to us is you allow us to worship you. God, help us to cherish the time that we have um, every Sunday where we gather together with uh, fellow believers. We come together as Christians to worship you, and right now we do it free of fear um, for what happens to us when we leave this place. God, we know that around the world many will not know that, that it will be a risk to their lives just to gather with other believers. So, God, we know this is one way you are so good to us right now at this current time is that we can come together and worship you, listen to your word, and we can do it free from persecution. We pray that that you would continue this, I guess, anomaly in the history of Christianity that we've been enjoying here in the West. God, please maintain it. God, we thank you for your word, and we now come to your word. We continue to worship by looking into your word and seeking to apply it to our lives. God, help us as we look at what a church is, how it's composed. God, help it to apply it to our church. God, I I pray that this church would always be, um, above all, seeking to be obedient to your word in every way, Um, not just in the ways that are most popular, uh, but in ways that are not popular in ways that the world thinks is foolish, even in ways that other Christian churches would think would be foolish. God, help us to be obedient to your word and to seek to do your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I came into the Army in 2005 here from Lawton, shipped off to Fort Benning, Georgia. And in 2005, the Army was going through one of its, really the military as a whole, but mainly the Army was going through one of the biggest changes that he had ever experienced since World War II. So what military strategists and high-ranking Army officials discovered was that the Cold War era Army was too big and too slow to meet the the threats that were posed to the world. Um, They needed to change the way that they were structured in order to be able to rapidly respond to any threat around the world, whatever it may be. So they, they took the division idea and they applied it on a smaller level, a smaller unit, a brigade, And within that brigade, that brigade would have everything that they need to support themselves, to sustain themselves, to all of the fire support they need, all the artillery they need, all of the transportation. It would all be in one package. And that would enable the Army to become uh, rapidly deployable. So it was a huge change that took place in the Army structure, the biggest since World War II. And they, and they did it. And if you know what was going on from that early 2000 time period, even till now, you see the threats that we face around the world. We had Iraq and Afghanistan going on. And so there was a, it was a different type of warfare happening in the world that continues to still happen today. So the Army had to adapt and change. Today we're going to be talking about church structure, church governance. And what is needed today is not ingenuity on our part to adapt It's not borrowing from the private sector in order to become more efficient. It's a return. It's not a something new to discover to implement a church. It's a return to something old, something from the New Testament, the way the New Testament church was structured, because this is God's model of the church. We can say whatever we want about pragmatism and what works, but we seek to implement what will be God's model of a New Testament church. It seems as though we've been hitting on some really hot-button topics lately, if you've been here for the past month, controversial issues, and this will be no doubt another one of those for sure, church governance, one of the hot-button topics in the church and how a church should be governed, um, with many different variety of opinions. So as we seek to get into this text, what we want to ask is, how was the New Testament church structured at Philippi? Because it would seem, as Paul planted that church and instituted it, that it would probably be the closest thing that we know to an early New Testament church being explained very explicitly. 
And so we seek to understand how they were structured, what do these terms mean, and then hopefully to implement it into our church. And hopefully other churches would implement this as well, that we would live by the rule of God and not by what we think works or what the private sector would tell us works organization. So today will be another one of those controversial topics as we come together to seek. So what we, what we seek to do is go to verse 1-1 one, one and understand a New Testament church structure. That's what we want to do. So today we'll see in our text, if you're taking notes, three components of a New Testament church, specifically the church at Philippi. So three components of the Philippian church. Presidential candidate uh, Carly Fiorona, if you know who she is, she's been on news a lot for taking her shots because she's a woman. She's taken shots at Hillary Clinton. Um, She likes to tout her credentials as a successful businesswoman. So what she did and um, where she makes this claim as success, as a leader, is that she was the CEO of Hewlett-Packard. At a time when Hewlett-Packard was about to go under, she became the CEO. She completely remodeled their entire structure. I believe they bought out, merged with Compaq Presario. And underneath her leadership, they became the largest PC uh, company in the entire world. So they, uh, there's a lot of other things that went on, but one thing that you can say is that she changed the structure and she saved the organization. Now, many today in the church, in the Christian church, um, would look at the church in the same way as Carly Fiorona. They would say, if we can implement what works in a church, um, then we can have success. We can change the church structure. And, and so what they do when they adopt this mentality is they will take and model their church in ways that are completely unbiblical. So what they'll, you'll end up with is a CEO ruled or led congregation. And those will be all over the city. You could drive a few miles and find one that has a CEO ruled or led congregation. There may be other staff, but those staff really, their opinions mean little. It's what that man or that woman, depending on what church you would be in, decides is the direction that that church needs to go. So a CEO Ruled. You'd see these in a lot of mega churches, so 2,000 plus in attendance. Um, the power at the top, much like a, a corporation. Okay, the other you would have would be that we will adopt whatever is going to work in our church for this area. And what works would typically mean whatever we have to do to fill our church seats up, because that is what modern the modern word would tell you is success in a church. It's not measured by biblical criteria. So Whatever you have to do to fill the church seats up, to grow numerically, you'll implement. And a lot of times, if you don't have a CEO-ruled mentality, you can end up with a mob-rule mentality. Whatever the mob decides is what will go in the church. So we, what we want to do is ask, instead of what works in the private sector, what do, what do organizations do to model themselves and create, uh, we want to ask ourselves, how has Jesus established his church to be? And if we want to be obedient, we will worry about that first and let him do what he will do with his church. Um, Many would measure success purely on the size of your church, to which I've heard one man say, I can't remember who it was, that many don't think too much of yourself if you have a large church because many people will drive along to go to a circus. So that's not always the measure of a healthy church, right? Now, contrary to this is the belief that um, the church should exist to build up the saints. The church exists to encourage the saints to build up the body of Christ. It's a safe place. Sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our mind around this. But, for instance, in Philippi or any other place where the New Testament church was growing, the world was against you. If you became a Christian, when you became a Christian... You're, now, you're saying no longer that those people that are worshipped, so for instance, the emperor, he's not your God. You don't say he's Lord and Savior, which is what they would have said. Jesus is Lord and Savior. So now, everyone that you once was, you were with is now against you. Or if you're a Jew, your family disowns you. So all you have is the church. So the church is your safe place and a hostile environment. So the purpose of the church that we see in the New Testament is this church, a church is a place where Christians are safe together, that they build one another up, they teach one another, they admonish, instruct one another, they equip each other, and they equip each other to go out into the world. Because the world is a, is a foreign land. So you see in Philippi, 
um, that Paul will use the term that we are members of a new colony. So Philippi is a colony of Rome. He'll say, you're members of the colony of heaven. And so what you do is this outpost of heaven is you take the advancement of your kingdom into the world. So together you build one another, take the message of what you know out. And we've kind of gone through that and unpacked that the past several weeks. So the church is the place where the saints are built up, God is worshipped, and then together they, the church goes out into the world to proclaim this message of Jesus and His redemption. So today when we see in Philippians 1, um, we see who Paul addresses the letter to. We're going to see three components of what a healthy church is. So <clears throat> three components of the Philippian church. Now let's recap some important things about the letter. Paul planted this church 10 years prior to the writing of this church. So right now it's 8062. Paul's in prison, waiting trial, waiting to stand before Caesar to give an account. And what he'll do is he'll pray that they, he would have boldness of speech to preach, to tell the gospel to the most powerful men and men in the world. And so Paul's waiting. He doesn't know what the outcome of the trial will be, but he's hopeful that he'll return again to see the Philippians. He urges the Philippian church to maintain unity. He urges them to, to be humble because humility is what maintains unity. And he, and he continues to be proud and to urge them on to advancing the gospel together through unity, which is the theme of the book, to advance the gospel together through unity. And there we'll see many great things in this letter. But before we get there, we see what is the church structured like at Philippi. So some things to ask yourself as we move forward is what is a church to you? What do you think of when you think of what a church is? What does the church do? And who is the head of the church ultimately? Does it lie in a pastor, a man, or who is ultimately the head of the church? Now, the sermon can change the way you view the church. If you listened, I think, to what God says in His Word, it can also potentially alter, alter your view of how you view your participation in a church or in this church or in and how you gather together with each other to do ministry. It can alter how you view what the church is and your part and how you fit into that church. So that's my purpose this morning is to just expose to you as plainly as I can the structure that we see at Philippi and hopefully that um, we will seek to be a church that models this, that adopts this as the model, as our model of how the church is structured and that you would find your place as being a member of a local church, church is highly important because every member in the New Testament church is extremely important to that church's health. So let's look at these three components of the Philippian church. The first, the church is a local assembly of saints. Now you might say, no kidding. But there would be many different views of what a church really is. And what we see plainly said in the first verse is that this letter is addressed to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. So this letter is addressed to Christians. And last week, we spent a lot of time talking about what that word saint means and what it means. It's, it means to be set apart. It means to be called out by God, by His will, and He sets you apart from other people to a task, to a purpose. We, we uncovered that it means holy one. That is how you could literally translate it, to the holy ones. And But we understand that it's a way of Paul saying to all of those true Christians that are in Philippi that have been set apart by God to a task to proclaim God's excellencies together. So to, the, to those Christians that are in Philippi. And, the, and I don't think it's a coincidence that the church is listed first. You have overseers, which means elder, pastor, and you have deacons listed. But the church is listed first because the church in Paul's mind is of primary importance Okay, the elder, the overseer, and the deacon are a part of this whole. They don't exist outside of this, driving this other. They exist within this congregation of all the saints. So they're listed first. And so what you'll, ha- what you'll find is in nearly all of Paul's letters, including this one, he addresses his letter to the entire church congregation. So all of those who could read Paul's letter could read, but many couldn't read. So anyone in the congregation sitting that was a Christian that would hear this letter read to them, it's addressed to them. It's not addressed to a special class of people. It's addressed to every Christian in this congregation at Philippi. And so he does that. You see this pattern of him doing it. So for instance, to those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, Romans. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called together to be saints, Corinthians. 
to the churches of Galatia, Galatians, to the saints who are at Ephesus, to the church at Ephesus. And then we have to the saints and faithful brothers at Colossae, to the Colossian church, and then to the church of the Thessalonians. So Paul addresses his letter to everyone in the congregation that are Christians. And then in our text, um, we see it addressed to the saints again, to all of the Christians, those that have been called out of this world and into a new realm that worship God together, that serve one another, that have been set apart for a purpose to proclaim God's excellencies together. And so we unpacked what a saint is. They're God's set-apart people. And Peter clearly states what that means in 1 Peter 2.9. He says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. That's who the letter is addressed to. It is addressed to all of the Christians, to God's holy people, His own possession, His holy nation. It's addressed to a royal priesthood, all believers, not a special class of ordained ministers, but the royal priesthood of all believers who have been set apart in Christ Jesus. So Paul, so Paul addresses his letter first to the entire congregation. Congregation. It's it's extremely important. The congregation in Paul's mind and in God's mind is extremely important. The local assembly of believers wields the primary authority in the church. And here's how I, I will explain that to you. Okay, it has primary responsibility in um, addressing personal disputes that can end in someone being kicked out of a church, church discipline. So Jesus provides guidance for how to handle personal disputes where he'll say, if someone sins against you or you have something against someone else and there's sin involved, then you go to that person. If you can't fix it, this is Matthew 18, take someone else in the church with you. If you can't resolve it or this person won't stop sinning and won't repent, he doesn't say take it to the ordained minister next. He says take it to the entire congregation. Take it to the whole church. If that person won't listen to the whole church, the whole church is the one that is said to remove that person. Okay, This doesn't reside in a few power people that can make that decision to remove someone from a church. It resides within the responsibility of the church membership. This tells me that churches ought to take very seriously their individual commitment and responsibility to a local church because God holds you accountable. He holds you accountable to everyone else in the congregation. It's not just the pastor. So if there's someone in the congregation living in sin and you know about it but fail to do anything against it, God is telling us that the church as a whole bills responsibility for that, and that means you, everyone that is a member of the local church. But it is not just that. The local church, the assembly of believers, all the saints, bear the responsibility of membership and discipline, which, which we descended to. So in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul will write to the Corinthian church, and he'll say, hey, you guys are boasting in grace, but there's somebody in your church that's doing things that even a Gentile won't do. He's doing something so abominable, not even the Gentiles will do it. He's living in such sexual sin, it's not even known outside the church. And he'll say to them, um, we don't judge out those outside the church. That's not our place. God judges them. But to those inside the church, those claiming to be Christians, you bear the responsibility. And by you, he means all of you. You bear the responsibility to confront this man, and if he won't repent, to put him out of the church completely. Because this man is a threat to the gospel at this point, if he won't repent. Because people on the outside see it. They say, he claims to be a Christian. But he does everything, or more than any of us would even do. So he tells the whole local church, the congregation, put that man out of your church. Okay, This responsibility doesn't land in a select elite class. It, it lies, the responsibility lies in the congregation. You go to 2 Corinthians 2, what you have is, it appears that this man has repented of that sin. So Paul says to them, show forgiveness and love and welcome him back in. All right, so the church is responsible now for a repentant sinner to forgive them, to love them, and to welcome them back. So we have to ask ourselves this question. If the church has the responsibility to kick people out, because that's what he tells them, remove them from your membership, 
and they also have the responsibility to bring people back into the membership, there must have been some type of membership in Corinth where they know who is part of this church and who's not part of this church. So that should also make all of you take your membership even more serious because it is the local church who is responsible for its members, for removing them, and for joining them to themselves. It doesn't belong in a set-apart people where they will say, oh, you're part of the congregation, let's judge. You'll be the judges of these people. We'll trust you to do it. No, it's the entire congregation's responsibility to take seriously what God has us to do. But third, the entire congregation is also responsible for church doctrine. In Galatians, Paul will tell the churches of Galatia, not to the elders and pastors over, he tells the churches of Galatia, if anyone is preaching a gospel contrary to what I preach, let them forever be accursed. So what he's telling them, you as churches bear the responsibility for judging what's being taught in your congregations. You are responsible to God for what's being taught in your congregation. So if someone is teaching something contrary to the Bible, the church bears the responsibility of getting that person out. Paul will say, even if I do it, you bear the responsibility of holding this responsible. So we have these, we see these ways that the church, local assembly, um, has a great amount of responsibility on it before God, not before man, what God expects his local congregation to do, what is taught in that church, and how its members um, reconcile with one another, and who becomes one, and who is put out. Okay, the church, in God's mind, um, every member, every Christian, every set apart saint bears responsibility together as a body of believers. Now that makes you think about something. That makes you think maybe every member should be a serious student of God's Word. Or how can you hold a teacher responsible? I would fully expect every member of this church to hold me accountable and responsible if I were to go crazy and begin to teach something counter to God's Word. It is your responsibility to do that. And to do that, you have to know God's Word to be able to do it. It all makes membership extremely important. So first, the church is composed of all saints in a local assembly. It's to the church at Philippi. All the saints there. But next, the church is composed of elders who provide oversight to that church. So the next two components of the local church we look at as overseer and deacon or elder and deacon are best understood as God's uh, given gifts to the church to or functions that enable the church to work and to function properly. And the first that we look at is that of overseer. If you look back to your text, it says, with the overseers and deacons. And an elder is what the, the term is. So the first we should ask is, what does that even mean, an overseer? The term over, uh, overseer is synonymous and used interchangeably with elder, pastor, overseer. They're used uh, intermixed. So s- sometimes they're used in different Greek words, they're still used interchangeably. Overseer, elder, pastor. And you probably know the term pastor. That's what's most familiar in our culture, and that's what's most widely used of the term elder, is on the rise and used more often today than it has been in the past. And we get this from, uh, we know, here's what that term means, now who are they? First Timothy 3 and Titus 1 tells us who they are. Uh, first off, they are to be men. If you turn over to your text... To 1 Timothy 3, I'll read the criteria for someone being an overseer or elder or pastor. They are men. That is the first thing that we see. And before I read it, what's kind of amazing about this list of what's required of an overseer, elder, pastor, what's amazing about this list is it's not that amazing of a list. Let's read it. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble, t- noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the household? Uh, well, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he, may, or he may become puffed up with the conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace 
into a snare of the devil. So if we were going to come up with a list of who do we think can oversee or lead God's church, who do we think it could? We might would come up with something like um, maybe he needs to have an IQ of 100 and something. He's got to be really smart. This person have a high IQ. Okay, they need to have great management skills because they'll be doing a lot of managing type of things. We might would come up with that. We might say they need to have great charisma. People need to be drawn to this person. They need to be a natural leader. Or maybe we'd even set parameters. This person who's going to lead God church should have 10 years plus of leadership, leadership experience or they can't lead God's church. Okay, our, our idea of what makes a good leader isn't should be obvious what God's idea of someone who can lead his church is. What does he say? He says things like, hey, they shouldn't be a drunk. And we think, well, that would be, seem to fit for anybody. They should be um, well thought of by everyone, including those inside and out of the church. They should be self-controlled. They should manage their own household well. So the list isn't that miraculous. They should be able to teach, teach the Bible to God's word. What should become apparent is that God is primarily concerned with the person's character rather than even the person's leadership experience. God is concerned that this person be a mature Christian. So God's criteria of who can serve in this doesn't always match what ours is. And we should go off of God's list, not ours, when we seek to look to see who can be an overseer elder of the church. So what do they do? What does an overseer elder do in the church? That's what we should ask ourselves. They lead the church through God's word. That's how they lead primarily. They provide spiritual oversight for God's church. This is the role. They equip the saints for work of the ministry so that God's people themselves can be ministers of God's word and minister to one another. Paul speaks to the Ephesian elders in Acts, and we get a glimpse of the idea of what an overseer elder is to do in the church. In Acts 20, 28, he says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, that's being the church, in which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So what does he tell them? He says, Paul says to the elders, he says, take, pay careful attention to yourself and to the God's flock. Why? Because the church is so important to Jesus. What did he say? He obtained it with his blood. So they are to provide oversight for the flock. They are to pay careful attention to these people. And why do we see? We see because there will come into the church fierce wolves seeking to destroy the flock. Now, these aren't people coming from outside the church, if you read this in context. These are wolves rising up from within the church, seeking to cause division and to destroy the church. So we see another role of the, of the overseer elder is to protect the church as a whole, from those that would rise up and destroy the church, to protect God's church, because it's precious to Him. So how do they do that? How do they provide oversight, careful oversight, spiritual guidance for God? God's people, for his, for his sheep, as he calls them. These are God's sheep. They don't belong to the overseer elder. They belong to God. So how does the person who is put in charge of overseeing, how does he do it? Um, well, we get a hint in our text by the term with. If you look back in, in, in your text, you'll see that he uses the term with. These aren't overseers from the outside. God's sheep as if they're cattle. They're not way out in front vision casting. These are elders, overseers with God's people from within. They are with God's people. Peter 5.24 tells us this. Peter says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So shepherd them like a shepherd shepherds the sheep. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to your flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. Okay, there is, at the last sentence, it should tell you, there is a great measure of accountability of those who would be overseers, pastors, which is where we get the word from shepherd, pastors, will give an account to the chief pastor, the chief shepherd, 
Jesus. And they're to exercise oversight not under compulsion, not for shameful gain, not because they love money or they want gain or they want popularity or power. They're not to domineer over. They're to shepherd as a shepherd would walk with sheep and take care of sheep. That is what a pastor, an an overseer, an elder does with the church. And that's why Paul uses the term with. Because if you know anything about shepherds, they are with the sheep and they smell like sheep. Okay, they are not outside the sheep. They are within the sheep, walking with the sheep. They smell like them because they're with them all the time. I'll never forget, I, I was in, um, where was I at? In Kuwait, in the middle of this big desert. And I'll never forget the sight of a man walking with his sheep, and there is nothing around but sand. And I'm like, this man has water to drink of which I know not of. I have no clue what he's doing out there with these sheep. But he's out there in the middle of the desert. He has no camel back on. I've got my water source. So he's just out there walking in the middle of his sheep in the desert. And I always remember that picture. That that's how God expects his overseer to be in his sheep with them, walking together uh, with him. They smell like the sheep. Primarily by being with God. They don't shepherd from an ivory tower. They don't shepherd behind, pushing like a cattle driver. They shepherd from within God's church, His congregation. He directs them at the way they should go, provide oversight by using God's Word. Here's another. Elders are not visionaries. This is a big deal for me that really kind of irks me. Elders, overseers are not visionaries. We are not vision casters. If that's the type of leader you're looking for, you're in the wrong church. People ask me, what's your vision for the church? I don't have a vision for the church. None. And why do I not? Because I don't want to get in the way of Jesus' vision for this church. I'm not a vision caster. This is Jesus' church. He takes the church where He wants it to go. He's the visionary. He builds the church, and it's not my place to get into His way on how He would build His church. I intend only to be faithful to what I see the Bible commands that I do, that I'm required to do as an overseer, elder, pastor. And I think it's crystal clear. Do you remember after Jesus' resurrection what happens? Uh, Peter and they've all gone back to fishing. I, I guess they don't know what else to do. But Jesus comes back. He's at the shore and John. And when you go to John, you see this encounter, the end of John. And here's Peter and Jesus takes him aside. And he says to him three times, Peter, do you love me? And if you know, this is because he rejected him three times. And you're like, so let's have this view of Jesus. He's so nice, he would never offend. But just the asking of the question three times has to be like three nails in Peter's heart. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Lord. And what does it say? Be a great vision caster, Peter. Be a, build my church large with great buildings. Have an international ministry, Peter, if you love me. No, he says, Peter, do you love me? And what does he say? Feed my sheep. Three times. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Charles Spurgeon once said, A time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. And I have no problem telling you that time is here. If you don't think me, if you don't think it's true, take a break, drive to any church around, many of them, and be entertained all you want. So if you're here to be entertained, then you have also come to the wrong church, because I never intend to entertain you. I hope that this place is as not entertaining as possible, because you're all entertained to the max. You're entertained six days a week. When you come into here, you should be forced to reflect on who God is. It should drive you to a place of worship. And then the preaching of God's word should feed your soul. It should not entertain you. There are plenty of places where you can go to be entertained. This won't be one of them. But also, what I am to do is to equip the saints. We see this in Ephesians 4.12. It is explained that teachers and shepherds, it says that we are to equip the saints for work of ministry. Okay, this means that in a church that's functioning in a healthy manner, there aren't just set aside people who are ministers of the church, that are ordained ministers. There are just people um, that have been equipped by God to train other people through God's Word so that they might do ministry. 
So everyone in God's church, all saints, the priesthood of all believers, exist to be ministers to one another and to minister uh, who God is out into the, into the world, apart from the church. And a pastor, a shepherd, overseer, one of their primary functions is to equip God's people so that they can carry out that, that function. So I am going to stand accountable for that. So one day when the chief shepherd appears, the Bible tells me that I will stand before God and the conversation uh, will not go, Jay, were you a visionary leader? Did you build a big church building? Did you provide awesome worship experiences with fog and lasers? I will stand accountable and I will give an account for how I shepherded God's people, how I fed God's people, how I equipped them for ministry. He'll ask me, did you feed my sheep? Did you protect them from false teaching and from wolves who would destroy them? Did you equip them for ministry? And I intend to answer the best of my ability. I did all that I could to do that. But also this task is too great for one man. The task is too great for one man to be the ruling elder of a church. And that's why there is always a plurality of elders in the New Testament congregation. You won't discover in the New Testament a church that's headed up by a big dog CEO pastor. You see a plurality of elders. This is what we see in the New Testament. This is why Paul says the overseers, plural. And now we get to what separates a New Testament church, a truly Bible-believing church, one that would say, sola scriptura, every word of the Bible we will obey no matter what, and those that say they believe that, but really the Bible is like the Queen of England. Okay, you know, the Queen of England has no authority, but just looks good. And this is, I believe, one of those tipping points to where you found a, chur- a, a church that says, I believe the Bible, and I will follow the Bible above else. And that is that there is a plurality of elders. There is a plurality of pastors and overseers in that local church, whereas the church is um, gets to the point where it is at a place where they can have multiple elders, they go to them. Not all of them are ready to do that. But when they are there and ready, and God has given those people, they need to go there because that is what we see happening in the New Testament. This is what separates many New, a New Testament church from just someone who's doing a church pragmatically. Okay, the SBC, of which we're a part, often has CEO-ruled churches. It's just a fact. It's a fact of life. Or, if you flip that... They don't have CEO-ruled churches. What they have is deacon-ruled churches, where deacons who cannot teach and do not meet the biblical qualifications as an overseer elder are on a deacon board ruling that church as an elder body. They're doing the function of an elder, but it's a deacon board. Okay? And what has happened in the past 50 years is the SBC has adopted something that Baptist churches never would have dreamed for the past 200 years, and that is deacons functioning as elders. You say, it doesn't really matter. They're doing it. Well, it does matter because God's Word specifies that there are overseers and deacons. So why does it not make sense that we would just follow God's Word and have both functioning in the church as God intends? So I would say that uh, there are many SBC churches now recognizing this, and they're reforming, which is good. It's a good thing that the church has recognized it. They're reforming. They recognize this, and many are going to what I think is the biblical model. Now, this protects the church. It protects God's church. He, he institutes this way because it protects it. If you have a plurality of elders, what this does for the local church is it protects you from a pastor that is dominant, domineering over and having his way or driving the church as a CEO. If there's more than one pastor, it should not be able to happen. I'm not saying that it can't happen, but it should not be able to, because there are other going to be other men holding that person accountable. It also protects the church from mob rule mentality. Now, I'm sure all of you, if you've been in church for very long, you know the nightmare of a church business meeting that can occur. And how does this happen? It happens because in many churches, the mob rules. Whether that, those people are even regenerate Christians or not, we don't know. Hopefully they are, but many times we know that many churches will be driven by a select few that are powerful. And so the church gets driven by mob rule mentality. But this can't happen 
when uh, overseers and elders arise out of the church, as God intends, the church recognizes them and sets them apart for the work of that ministry to oversee the church and to lead it through God's word. And then the congregation is with those people and following them because they're leading by God's word, not because they're leading because that's where they want to go. So it protects the church on two fronts. Um, So the first that we've seen, or the first was that the church composition is of all saints, of all of all the Christians in a location. The second is that God's church is composed of overseers. Okay, more than one. There is a plur- there's plurality, and there's accountability in that. But now we see that the church is composed of deacons. Now, I guarantee, if any of that was not controversial, this will be controversial to you in the stance that I come down on on this. A few years ago, I preached at what I would say is a normal Southern Baptist church in Missouri, a larger, a larger church, maybe 300 in attendance uh, every morning. They, they had no pastor. They had me to come to preach to fill their pulpit. So what happened, and if you know how this works, there is a power deacon at a church, and you all know who I'm talking about. So you have a power deacon who's been at that church forever that really he is driving that church. The church goes the direction he wants it to go. So he was a little hesitant of me and asked me about my church, my home church, because we had more than one pastor. We had a, a plurality of elders. So he inquired to me. He said, what is, you know, what's the deal with your plurality of elders? So I explained to him, well, the, it seems in the Bible we see that, so we go to that model. Um, these people are pastors to take care of God's people. Um, you know, when people are sick, they'll visit them. They teach the Bible in our church. They're the Sunday school teachers. Um, they are accountable to one another. They're accountable for what happens in the church financially. And so it protects God's church from all of this stuff. He said, yeah, we have that too. That's called our deacon board. And he was dead serious. Dead serious. And so, I, you know, I was just polite, but I went on. But, you know, you don't have it too. You have something functioning in your church that is contrary to God's word. And this shouldn't be, especially in a denomination that says that we believe in the inerrancy of God's word, that every word of it is God's word and it's perfect. Should we not function in a capacity that reflects God's Word. Uh, This is real life. This is real life, and it it is in many churches. Um, Deacons are distinct from elders. So what is a deacon? A a deacon simply means servant. Someone who um, who has been equipped by God to meet a need in the church. So, for instance, a deacon is not this, and this is what most of us know it as. Men who have been set aside and ordained by the laying on of hands and will maintain that deacon status no matter what church they go to. I remember going to an ordination of a pastor um, who was going into the ministry, and they called for any ordained men to come forward, and there was like 50 men. I'm like, who are all these guys? And they're like, oh, these are all the, all the deacons. And I'm just like, hey, you know, that seems weird to me. It seems a little bit, I don't see it happening in the Bible. Is there something special about this class of men that um, is better than God's calling to ministry? Is there something that they infuse to, to, this, to this man that's going into the ministry? So Charles Spurgeon would talk about the um, strangeness of having ordained people that whenever they leave a church, they maintain that ordination wherever they go. Um, they're ordained deacons for the rest of their life. He'll say, is it not odd that a student graduating my college is now the Reverend, um, let's call him Tommy Jones? He has gone to a congregation, been, hands have been laid on him that apparently have infused to him the power to become known as Reverend. He's now Reverend. He wasn't Reverend before, but now he's Reverend. And how ironic is it that he, leaving my college from a president, Charles Spurgeon, who is not reverend, who has never been called reverend, because I've never gone through the man-made procedure of being called and made a reverend. So we have many things that uh, are left over. You could say that many times we display evidence that we have a Roman Catholic hangover, that there are elements of how we do church that aren't necessarily found in the Bible. So a deacon arises to meet a ministry need in the local church. If that ministry need goes away, the deacon um, steps down from that ministry. If a ministry needs arises, say, for instance, 
Maybe you have many uh, women sick in the hospital. Okay, I can't minister to women like another woman could do. Why would there not be a deacon that arises to meet that ministry need? Because that's how you see things functioning, I believe, to function in the Bible. There's a need. God equips people to meet that need. They're deacons of that church. So who can serve as a deacon? That's the question. Who can serve in this task? If deacon means servant, and these servants aren't overseeing, and they don't contain authority, which is the biblical evidence, who could serve as a deacon? Now here's where things will get controversial. I'm just going to tell you that it is right up front so that you know, so that you're ready. But hear me out. Um, We see the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3. They are literally just like the qualifications for an elder overseer. If you turn to 1 Timothy 3, you're going to see it. Okay. The exception is that deacons don't have to be able to teach. Because in teaching, men are providing oversight and leadership. Okay? And women can't do that. So we'll get to that in a second. But deacons don't have to be able to teach. They may be able to teach. There may be some men deacons who could teach better than me, phenomenally. They're great Sunday school teachers or whatever they are. So, but they don't have to be. It's not a requirement. Okay? That doesn't disqualify you from being a deacon. Another exception of deacon is that deacons in the church can be women. For some, this is a controversial statement, and I understand it. But let me tell you why it's controversial. It's not controversial because we get there from the Bible. It's controversial because we have products of our culture. Okay? Just like the, the, the head deacon, the power deacon, in his mind, a deacon leads and provides over, over, uh, oversight for the church. A deacon board provides uh, authority, there is authority in his mind wrapped up in what a deacon is. That's because he's mixed these two functions that God has given to his church. There are elder seer overseers who do that. Those are men. It is limited to men, always. But then in the deacon side, it is not. But in our mind, when they're mixed and we mix these two offices together... That's when, what's when the confusion arises, I think, and it becomes part of our culture. For instance, I was reading through, not that history matters, but I found a document as early as 1609 that said that Baptists had women deacons. I know that's shocking because we think it's an invention and a, we're placating to liberalism creeping into the church. 1609, another in 1611. So this is an, it's an, old, it's an old thing, and the reason it's old is because there's biblical evidence for it. Let's get to the biblical evidence Going to have to speed up. So we go to uh, 1 Timothy 3. First, in the original language, um, what it says is women likewise. When you get to 1 Timothy 3.11, it says women likewise. Now, the structure as it unfolds in the text, it gives criteria for elders. It then gives criteria for deacons, where it says deacon likewise. And then, in the most some translations, you might have them, might say women. Some of them still say wives of deacon or women. Uh, deacons' wives, but it originally says women. Okay, there's, no, there's not an article in front. Um, there's no word that specifies there. It just says women. So you have elders, you have deacons likewise, then you have the phrase women likewise. And so I believe that there is textual evidence there in First Timothy 3 to support this case. But it is also extremely odd if you don't take that belief, if you think that text in First Timothy 3 is actually speaking about the deacons' wives... You have to ask yourself, why did God, did he give directives for how a deacon's wife is to be when he just didn't give any directive for how an elder's wife should be? Do you see that in the text? There is no mention for how an elder's wife is to be. Okay? And the reason that I think that is is because he never is addressing how wives are to be. He's addressing how the people serving in those roles is to be. So you have elders, you have deacons, and then you have women serving in a deacon role. And if you understand what deacon means, it just means servant, then you can understand how the text unfolds. But there is also specifically listed in Romans 16.1, a woman that serves as deacon. Now, Phoebe is said to be a deacon. She is deacon of the church of Sincre. I can't say this word, but many people have written and tried to get out of what I believe the text is plainly saying. Because what the the text is plainly saying is when deacon or servant of church, said church, right? So deacon of this church. Okay, that is a way in the language to denote a title, not to denote that she just served sometimes in the local church. So Phoebe 
Romans 16.1, is said to have served as a deacon of a specific church. And if you know historically why there were women deacons is because there were tasks that women did in taking care of other women that men can't do and shouldn't do. And they can do it better. So there's the biblical evidence. There's also historical evidence as early as A.D. 111. So Pliny, the governor of Bithynia, captured some women of a local church. He was torturing them to get information so that he could go and wipe out the Christian community. So AD 111, this is still at the end of when the apostles lived. You have to understand that. So some of them, they probably all just died. So this is very early. In this church, these women, it is said, were deacons of the church. So you can't put historical evidence on the, on the plane with biblical, but it's good to get to supplement to see what was happening in the early church. Now, why have men, women, uh, men and women deacons? Like I said, there are various roles that can be done that should be done only by women. Some women can take care of other women in certain crisis situations and should serve in that capacity, and a man should not serve in that capacity unless something, um, unless something happened that could be seen on the outside as, as a suspect of, of being impure. Okay, so there, there are women serving all over the city right now, uh, taking care of children that will be called children's director. Why not just call them what they are, children's deacon? They're taking care of children. Okay, let's, let's call them what the Bible would call them and not call them director. Okay, we are not a marketing company or a CEO company. We're a church. Let's call people what the early New Testament church called them. All right. Also, women can do better than I can do this capacity, Titus 2.4. It says to train the young women to love their husbands and children. Okay, I can do that to an extent, but I can't do it as good as another woman can coming alongside another woman and living with that woman and training her. And men can do things better than women can do. I know that right there is completely controversial today. But God has (laughs) developed men and women with a complementarian structure. We complement each other. Men can take care of this building and the grounds better than women can do. And so you see, naturally, servants arising in the church that can take care of things that God has equipped them to do in a capacity um, that is better suited to men than, is better, than, than those that, are also, that would be for women. Okay, so what you need to hear me say is that in a church with a deacon board where men are acting as elders, there should never be a woman deacon. Okay, because that church has now positioned them, play themselves in a position to compromise themselves two times to where a woman could exercise authority over a man. So what you need to hear me say is that the place of authority of elder overseer, pastor, is for men only. And women don't exercise authority over men, and they won't. So as this church grows and develops, ministry needs pop up. There won't be a woman over a ministry that exercises authority over a man, because I don't think that's biblical either. But there are God-given roles to where women can exercise their gifts and serve in that capacity. And we should do our best to, to not be what's popular with the culture. We should attempt to be as biblical as possible. And the church is healthiest when we see us um, functioning in our God-given roles as He has appointed us to do. So let's, let's wrap it up quickly. I know we've gone a little bit long. Three components of the Philippian church. They're composed of all the saints at a location, all the Christians at a location. It's composed of a plurality of leaders, elders, overseers. And it's composed and served, the church is served by deacons. So here's my appeal to you to understand that what your place in the local church is. It's of of great importance if you are a believer and you have been set out apart, called by God, to assemble together with a local church to seek membership with each other for accountability so that you can exercise that oversight that God has given each member to exercise as far as sound teaching goes, as far as membership goes with each other. Um, you're vastly important. Everyone is important. Every member is vital. So a healthy New Testament church composed of all the saints, elders, deacons. Clint, here, here's uh, what we'd ask. We'd say, if you're like me, you'd say, why, why does it really uh, why does it matter? Why did God compose His church like this? So I'm curious. You probably asked that. Why did He compose His church to be like this and not some other structure, which we might would think works better? And I think it's found in this capacity. This is the way, number one, that the church can be healthy. It can protect itself the best. 
okay, from outside influence that would teach false doctrine or even those that would arise from within the church or teach false doctrine or would be divisive to the church. It is the best way to protect the church. Okay, but it is also the most easily reprodu- reproducible. This type of church can quickly reproduce itself. Okay, and you see this happening. The New Testament church, they try to, try to stamp it out. They try to crush it somewhere else. Some other gathering pops up. It can't be stumped out. It's like whack-a-mole. Boom. Can't quite get it to stop, and it keeps spreading throughout the whole earth. And this is because this way is highly reproducible. So we should try to set ourselves up to function in this capacity where we are too. There's a book called The Spider and the Starfish, and I haven't read it yet, but I want to read it. It's not really a book about the church. It's about organizations. And so the, the back of the book, the illustration, I think reveals to us, I think, how God has, why he has structured his church in this capacity. So he says, if you cut off a spider's leg, uh, the spider can't function. It's going to die a slow death. If you cut off a spider's head, the spider is going to die. If you cut off a starfish's leg, that leg is going to grow a new starfish. If you cut a starfish in half, boom, two new starfish. Okay, you can't kill the head of a starfish and kill the starfish because it will just continue to reproduce. And I think that can be applied directly to how we see the New Testament church spreading and adapting. And the reason that they can is because God has appointed the means for them to be able to do that. And it's found in this type of church structure. But how many large megachurches have you seen fall with one scandal from their CEO pastor and completely crumble to nothing from 3,000 to 50? How many times have you seen it play out on the national level? Over and over again. Perhaps this is because this isn't God's appointed method or means of functioning as a New Testament church. When persecution comes to the church, as it is across the world, Christianity can't be stamped out because it's impossible. You can't cut the head off of the Christian church because Jesus is already resurrected. And Jesus is the head of the New Testament church. And he's appointed his way to where, to where this, his local New Testament churches can function on their own autonomously, and then they can, they can scatter and start again if, it, if people try to stamp it out. The head of our church is Jesus Christ, and the Bible tells us that he must reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. So let's pray.